Thank you so much for, for joining us, uh, Ricardo. It's great to see you, my friend. My pleasure to be with you, Wade. Excellent, sir. And I know uh, 2020, we're going to be um, celebrating a couple of milestones, both the 40th anniversary of the brand and the 15th anniversary of the iconic Big Bang. But the first question I want to ask you is something you just posted on Instagram, um, and it relates to uh, time to reflect, right? And this is a message that you're saying is important for us to all take into consideration now. What does that mean to you, sir? Yes, in fact, this year is a 40 years anniversary of Hublot and uh, we thought about an hashtag that could be interesting, especially in these uh, particular moments that we are living uh, with this incredible crisis, unprecedented moment in the history. And uh, we said instead of a time to remember, because when you remember is more that you go back to the past, what happened in the past, we thought that time to reflect is of course uh, going to the past, but trying to, to take some lessons from the past, some inspiration from the past, and to project you in the future. So uh, talking about the past, but having a projection towards the future and how we can uh, reinvent ourselves always without uh, 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 thinking that uh, the past is also important. I totally agree with that. I think, you know, and I had the, a wonderful opportunity to talk to the great Mr. Beaver, who is, is a person that you and I both um, adore and respect a lot. And he was saying that I think uh, this time is going to be one in which people are going to really try to consider what is it that they want to be? Who, what is it that they want to represent afterwards, you know? And from the perspective of, of Hublot, it's always been about human relationships. Uh, it's also been about very genuine caring and affection for other people. Um, I would imagine, even though we're in a period where we physically may not be able to touch people, this is still something that will continue. W would you agree? Absolutely. I think, yeah, I think it's, it's uh, really important. And um, I think, yeah, th this crisis is, is really a moment where uh, it's time to reflect and, uh, and time to, to reconsider how is going to be our life uh, in the future. Of course, at a personal level, but also, of course, at our in industry and brand level. You know, one of the things that I think we've all been really thinking about also is, is it like, who do we respect in this world, right? I think from a, an ethics perspective, you know, of course, we used to admire people that were very powerful and rich, you know, that was great. But now we're in some ways really admiring people that are doing the jobs of cleaning and the, the jobs of like selling us our groceries and the jobs of like, uh, you know, uh, these very basic roles in society that we realize now um, have so much dignity and so much um, sort of nobility to them. And I hope it's something that we continue to, to take outside with us. One of the things that I've always noticed about Hublot is that everyone there feels um, very happy to be working there. They feel a sense of, of dignity. And I think that, you know, Mr. Beaver was always talking about how he felt it was important to treat people in this way and for people to show up with um, the idea that they're looking forward to working. Is that something that's very important to you more now more than ever? Yes, of course. I think, um, well, people, they've always been important. And we always talk about the Hublot family more than uh, the Hublot employees. You know, that's really the philosophy that, uh, uh, that we have. And I think that, uh, yeah, this crisis uh, will make us reconsider also the way of, um, of uh, creating watches, the way of communicating uh, on the, the products that uh, we have and all the charity uh, aspect, all the sustainability uh, aspect, I think it's going to be important. I think we will have to bring value to our products uh, considering those new parameters and uh, of course, we're already working on that, uh, you know, to, to have the traceability on the, on the materials that we use, for instance, and uh, also uh, the partnerships that we will have uh, in our marketing, always uh, having a, a kind of sense of what we're doing. And uh, I will take this, we want, of course, at our level to bring something to this planet Earth. And uh, we believe that, of course, Nature is very important and the preservation of nature. And we have seen that you have done, for instance, with the rhinos in, uh, in the Kruger Park, the protection of the rhinos. Some, some, and we will go further to, to really protect the life, uh, the nature, the, the oceans uh, of this uh, planet. 
That's awesome to hear, Ricardo. Ricardo, I, I, you know, I know that everyone in the watch industry travels a lot, but I, I'm inclined to believe I, if I looked at the air miles that you have clocked up over the years, you probably traveled the most. <laughs> I, as I recall, you were almost traveling on a daily basis, right? Yes. Um, how are you managing to stay connected to your teams, to your communities, to all the different ambassadors and all the different you know, uh, worlds that you have you created such an amazing connection with over the last couple of years in a time that we're not able to travel or physically sort of move around? Yes, that's uh, really incredible. The first time in my life that I don't travel since uh, since uh, uh, three months already now. So, so it's really incredible, and um, I hope we can travel again because uh, I have to be also positive. We will travel maybe in a different way, but uh, I hope we can travel again. And I would say that uh, the digital tools have become a kind of uh, of rule now, and we are doing now a Zoom. Uh, a conference and uh, I would say that um, the relationship that uh, we have kept uh, has been more through these uh, Zoom co uh, conferences or Teams conferences and uh, but of course uh, it, it doesn't replace the physical uh, uh, feeling but uh, I would say that we have to adapt ourselves to the new way of communication and uh, of course the events that's the big issue because, of course, we will not have events for the next months. Uh, still, the, the virus is still around, and uh, we are thinking about creating new concepts of uh, of uh, having an experience through through events with uh, either our partners and also our customers. Ricardo, you used to be in both trade shows. So I remember you were in Geneva, but you were also Basel. And of course, Basel, you had a, a really dominant presence there. Um, you also participated in probably the last trade show of this year, which was in Dubai in the beginning of the year as well. Um, now, uh, with everything changing around with Basel, kind of uh, there being kind of an exodus from Basel from the major brands initially with Paddock, Rolex, and Show Park, but then also with the group the following day. Um, what is the importance of a trade show, and do you still feel it, it, it fulfills a vital role in our, in our society and industry? Yeah, I would say um, my position was always that we should have one trade show for our industry. We cannot have to have two at the different dates was a bit uh, uh, unbelievable and uh, not respectful also to, to, for our customers or even our press. And um, I think that uh, now, we are coming to this solution is probably to have one trade show that uh, will be uh, almost for sure in Geneva in the in the future and uh, we hope that uh, all the watch industry can really uh, gather in this uh, Geneva Geneva trade show from uh, not next year but maybe uh, uh, the year after in 2022 i think of course basel it's a pity i've been in basel uh, since uh, 1988 so to, to think that uh, uh, there will not be Basel anymore, uh, yeah, it's uh, in a way, of course, sad, but we must go on. And I think that to be in Geneva, Geneva is the capital of the watch industry. It seems to me quite uh, normal and uh, common sense. Of course, the trade shows must evolve, but I think, as I said, the, the physical um, uh, feeling and uh, meeting people uh, either from, uh, the the retail uh, uh, wholesale distribution and of course the press uh, at one moment in the, in the year is something quite important but it's true that uh, today uh, is not as important as it used to be when you had to present your new collection and so on but i think it's still important if you have the possibility in one week to meet almost all the press from our industry and uh, almost all the our customer from our industry i think it's still important very cool. So let's kind of get into our time machine and go back to the year 2004. Um, this 2004 is one year before the Big Bang is released, and I had two very interesting experiences actually here in Singapore. Uh, the first was during a Tempest, uh, which was a fair created by our dear friend Mike Tay. Um, I got the chance to meet uh, Mr. Beaver, and then there he showed me the drawings that he had made. Uh, for the Big Bang, he, uh, the watch that was um, the first expression of fusion, really combining the future and the tradition of watchmaking. And then I had, uh, and I was you know, blown away by this, but then I had a, a different, ex another very interesting experience where I, I had the great opportunity to meet you for the first time, Ricardo. And at the time, um, I think you were just finishing up your tenure at another brand. Um, I think we had met in the old 
Mandarin Hotel on Orchard Road, you know, and we were having this conversation about uh, about Mr. Beaver and Hublo and the Big Bang, and and all of a sudden the following year we would see this incredible uh, expression that was you know a bit of a rupture from the past, right? Um, tell me a little bit about from your perspective in 2004 when Mr. Beaver, because I know he had, all, had, had basically approached and hired you by this point to be the CEO of, of Hublo. What when you he approached you with this project 15 years ago or 16 years ago? What did you think? You know, with uh, Mr. Beaver, we always had a contact, uh, regular contact uh, privately as well uh, since uh, Blancpain times, you know, and the uh, Swatch Group times. And uh, we talk about um, uh, some brands that uh, we could uh, consider uh, in 2003. I think our first discussion was in 2003 and Hublot came on the table and uh, we thought immediately that uh, Hublot had a great potential because the watch that they were uh, having at that time, which is the, still the classic that was uh, invented in 1980, inspired by a portal uh, called Hublot, because Hublot means portal in French. Uh, we thought that that watch had an identity. And of course, uh, they didn't really evolve in the product. Exactly, that's, uh, that's the watch. Uh, in the product since tw over 20 years. It remained like it is. Uh, and we thought that we should give a shock to that, to that watch and uh, to come with something that was more uh, uh, trendy, more uh, uh, yeah, fas in fashion at that time, a bigger watch, a chronograph. Of course, reposition the watch with a mechanical movement. And if it's a sport watch, maybe a chronograph. And at that time, we used uh, the Valjou uh, movement. And, um, and uh, keeping the DNA of, of, of that watch, of course, the screws on the bezel, uh, the ears with the screws, the screws on the, on the attachment uh, of, the, of the strap, using, of course, the rubber. And uh, after, I would say, the idea of Mr. Beaver of establishing what is the art of fusion, because in 1980, they did the first fusion, but they didn't know it was the art of fusion. So Mr. Beaver, you remember the famous design made by hand of explaining what is the art of fusion. Yes. Like a concept, you can just explain it with one page, it's enough. <laughs> and based on that, we thought that we should bring new materials, of course, and the ceramic was uh, the first material that came uh, at that time. Uh, and to really bring uh, this uh, fusion between materials. So at that time we came with a steel ceramic, gold ceramic watch. Uh, with a chronograph, uh, 44 millimeter size, and uh, and also the idea is the construction of the case, the sandwich co construction, which has been a revolution also uh, in the watchmaking, not only in the movement, the, but the construction of the case, which allows a lot of flexibility uh, to to for the design, for for the interpretation with the materials that we, you have seen in the future after. Yeah, I want to pull up a watch. Okay, not from 2005, but from 2006, because I think it, it, this is kind of like, this says everything about Hublot. And, and yeah. let's, let's also admit that even 15 years later, it's still super cool, right? So this is the original Big Bang. Uh, yeah. And then what I love about this is this is the all black, right? So this exactly. is what, what you call visible invisibility, which was basically everything on here is black. And then you have the ceramic, you've got the, the rubber and the pushers, the mixed materials. Um, I mean, this is this is like something that no one had ever seen. You know, it, it was it was really cool. Yes, absolutely. When uh, somebody asked me uh, what is your favorite watch, I always mention this one, the Big Bang All Black, because in addition, of course, of the Big Bang, the concept of being all black is really the ultimate concept of uh, what is really a, a luxury watch. You know, because meaning that at this, the time is secondary. It's what the watch represents as an object which is the most important, I would say, is even more valid today. And as you are saying, 14 years later, this watch is still very uh, up-to-date, very uh, trendy, fashionable, because it's really exactly what uh, we believe uh, customers are looking it's really for, for an object that has a, a concept, a strong identity. And uh, I would say we have brought also the black color as a standard color in the watch industry, because before that, it was not only, I would say, gold, steel watches, uh, white gold or platinum. But uh, after that, uh, I would say all the brands have come, maybe not 
all with the all black concept, but also with, uh, with the black watch and the ceramic is used by, I would say, all the, the luxury watch brands in our industry. Ricardo, I, you know, I, what I would like to ask you about is I think one aspect of Hublot that, that is very impressive, but people don't often talk about as much. So from a, a watch or as you guys say, product perspective, you've created a revolution. You've also created a revolution that's an intelligent revolution because you've made the watch very reliable and very efficient to make also because of the modular construction. And of course, this would play pay dividends later when you, for example, moved into a sapphire watch because then each sapphire piece doesn't have to be a massive piece of sapphire. It can be a smaller piece and then you're able to deliver a sapphire watch at a much better price than the rest of the market, you know? But, and so there's a real intelligence there in the approach. It's not just intelligence in terms of marketing or in design or in terms of product, but even in terms of, of you know, uh, of production, which is great. But one of the things that no one ever talks about is that at, during this period also, you and Mr. Beaver put together a company that is one of the most efficiently run and profitable companies in watchmaking. I mean, it's incredible how you, know, you started and within a few years time, how incredibly profitable you were. So much so that it became uh, very attractive to LVMH Group, as you know, to, to acquire you, and which was a great investment in their part, uh, uh, incidentally, also. So tell me a little bit about like the f corporate philosophy, the leadership philosophy at Cublo. How do you get people to work so efficiently, so in such a motivated way, and at such a high level? Yeah, I think, of course, it comes from the top management and the philosophy that we want to implement uh, to our people. And, uh, of course, also there, again uh, an idea from uh, Jean-Claude Beaver uh, was uh, this philosophy of being unique, uh, different and the first in everything that we do. So art of fusion and after philosophy of that and I would say this philosophy uh, is really implemented at every level of the company. Uh, of course in the product uh, development is very important to be uh, either first, unique, uh, particular, uh, disruptive as well in our products. But it's valid, of course, in our marketing and communication. And we have been the first brand to go into football. And uh, the sport of football uh, has been an accelerator of uh, brand awareness. And as you know, we started with the Euro Cup in 2008, UEFA here organized in Switzerland after the World Cup, uh, South Africa, Brazil, uh, last year, Russia. Uh, and um, this philosophy is really implemented also in the production level, in the delivery uh, level, uh, logistic, in the after sales service. And really, we want always to have this also startup spirit that even though we have become the most uh, important uh, company compared to 2005, where when we started, we were around 20 people and uh, uh, today we are uh, around 800 people. But still, the philosophy remains... Uh, this uh, startup spirit and this uh, always when you think you are doing something is it unique uh, maybe we are the first but at least we should do it in a different way but you know and I totally agree with all everything you said but one of the things that I'm particularly impressed with with Hublot and I can use a, a good example as well like, so basically there was a mutual friend of ours who was previously a journalist Augusto Capitanucci you know Absolutely. And Augusto, when he was a journalist, he was a guy that everyone loved because he was the most fun person to be around, right? Mm -hmm. But then Augusto got a job with you and became, you know, the director of certain regions for Hublot. So he became also in charge of the overall vision, the commercial vision of all. Yep. This guy is an animal today. I mean, this guy is a complete badass. You know, like he is so driven and so on point, you know, I mean, he has really become like this, you know, warrior king, you know? And, and it was interesting because I think that Hublot extracted this from him, um, that, you know, when, when I, I, so it was a very imp impressive thing to see. And when I talked to Mr. Beaver, he said, listen, Way, one of the things that we like to implement at Hublot is that if you can get two people to get, to do the job of three people, and those two people can do it better because they are more motivated and they are better, right? Then, then I would prefer to have this. This is one of the keys to, to keeping a company efficient. And I said, that's great, but how do you find these people? So how do you find these people, Ricardo? Yeah, I think there is an evolution. I would compare also to, to, uh, to a football team. You know, when uh, you start, when you are in fourth division and you go to the Champions League, 
you must have uh, the best players at every position, you know. So you must evolve on having a striker, having defenders, having a goalkeeper, and uh, having a midfield, and having uh, and you, you are you are the coach, and you have to manage all, all those players. And today, we are playing in the Champions League, so I want to have the best at every position, uh, if possible. So I would say um, it's it's a matter of uh, again meeting people, you know, and uh, having a, a good feeling because, of course, the human relationship uh, is really key. And in the case of Augusto, I think I met him through uh, being a journalist and I always had a very good uh, human relationship with him. And I saw that uh, he could have really a great potential for us. So it depends a little bit uh, on, on for the marketing director to say something. He comes from Ferrari, uh, Philippe Tardivel. So I met him through uh, the, the partnership that we had with the Ferrari in the Formula One as well. And uh, we had a good feeling. And when the position uh, became open, he, he asked me that he would be very interested to, to, to join Hublot. So it depends a little bit case by case, but uh, we always try to, to get really the, the right talents. And uh, I would say, uh, but also always with a very good uh, uh, alchemy in the, in the human relationship, which is very important, of course. I think that's a very important thing, and it's sometimes people forget about that too. It's the the human relationship has to be a strong one first, because then you can always communicate and you can always you know be honest and you can always succeed together. Um, okay, so you discussed uh, partnerships, and so let's talk about three di three different partnerships, each one which re represents in some ways a different um, world of, of Hublot. So maybe we'll start with the performance partnership first, and then you had mentioned a Ferrari, of course. So let's look at the tech frame, because this is a very interesting watch also, because it was created in collaboration with my dear friend Flavio Manzoni, who's the creative director of Ferrari, and his design studio there. It's the first time you actually invited, you know, or any watch brand invited external designers to work on that watch. And tell us a little bit about why you want to go that extra distance to make sure that Ferrari felt really included. Yeah, you know, Ferrari, of course, is a, is a key partnership for us. Uh, we have two pillars. One is football, the other one is a, uh, is a Ferrari. And with Ferrari, in this case, we have not been the first brand to do a partnership uh, with Ferrari, but we, we have tried to do it in a different way than the other brands previously. And of course, the product is, is a key element of the partnership. And uh, we, we believe that, you know, today to have a partnership where you just put the prancing horse on a dial is not, is not enough because people are really looking through a partnership to have something more deep, either in the design, in the technique. And I would say that we started with a Big Bang Ferrari, but the ultimate, uh, I would say, product where we have gone deeper is uh, the tech frame because in the tech frame, uh, it has been really 100% designed by uh, Flavio Manzoni. They were very motivated and we said, Okay, because we need to be inspired by not only our small industry, uh, we need to be inspired by other type of uh, industry, other type of partnership. And I would say that uh, the car industry, and of course Ferrari in particular, with this incredible team of design, creating incredible uh, cars like uh, this one, uh, La Ferrari, FX, uh, XK, this one. Uh, we said, okay, let's do it. We, but we must find the DNA, of course, of Ferrari, but also the DNA uh, of Hublot. Uh, but the design is totally open. So in this case, it was inspired by this frame, uh, open, uh, in which we keep to have our screws uh, on the bezel. We keep having an attachment with two push buttons in rubber. We use, of course, our engine uh, for us, our 12-cylinder engine, in a way, which is a chronograph tourbillon, 100% uh, in-house. And, uh, of course, the mix of the materials, titanium, uh, those red touch. And I think the result of this watch is, is amazing, you know, and it was uh, created uh, for the 70 years uh, of Ferrari. And it has been uh, an incredible success as well. You know, I, I hadn't thought about it until you mentioned it, but that's really cool. I like how the they screws your kind of signature bezel screws are actually one of the most critical elements here because Absolutely. it's the point of attachment between the exoskeleton or the tech frame and the central part of the watch. That, that's yeah. cool. Okay, awesome. So let's go from there um, to talk about a different collaboration. One, I had the pleasure to, um, to be with you during the, the announcement of it. Um, and it's 
with an artist, but an unconventional artist in that he is a, a fine artist who is also a tattoo artist, right? Maxime Bouchy, otherwise known as Song Bleu. Ricardo, tell us a little bit about, about this as well, because, you know, Maxime has a very interesting way of interpreting art uh, through, like, li uh, through lines. And I know that he was sort of inspired by everything from the stained glass windows in the, in the Swiss Protestant churches to uh, line drawings um, uh, from architecture and so on. But please tell us why you found him interesting to collaborate with. And actually, this has become one of the most enduring collaborations uh, for Hublot as well, you know? The approach is uh, that we wanted to, to create and to, to uh, create new platforms of communications. Of course, uh, Ferrari, as we said, is very important. But after we said art could be <coughs> something that uh, could be interesting because we believe that for the, the, the creation of the products uh, at Hublot level, you know, and the link to this famous art of fusion, we must really come with a very uh, unique and different products if we want to have success. Because if we produce traditional watches with a touch of modernity is not enough for us. There are other brands that are doing that very well since hundreds of years. So we thought that uh, we should be also inspired not only by our industry, watch uh, making industry, but also by other uh, worlds. And the art is one of it. And uh, how can we translate an art in a watch? Well, we thought that tattoo, uh, the tattoo art could be something interesting. And uh, I met uh, Maxim Bushi through uh, uh, somebody who founded the School of Graf uh, Graphic Art here in Switzerland, Pierre Keller, who, who died unfortunately uh, last year. Uh, he did this school and uh, when I saw his art, I thought there was a potential to translate this tattoo art in a watch, but not just again uh, doing a doll, uh, painted doll, but really bringing also some mechanics some techniques uh, uh, on the watch that gives you uh, an incredible new new design. And uh, we have worked on the first watch with him, which was uh, working with the hands, where, of course, again, the time is not really readable, but at the end, you can still read it. But uh, having uh, our minute and second hand, which is inspired by the graphics of uh, Maxime, and after we went further on the on the case by having those facets on the bezel and some engravements uh, on the rest of the case. And I would say that this watch is unique. No other brands make this kind of products and uh, you can like it or not like it. But when you like it, you love it. And in this case, uh, you buy it. And uh, the commercial success has been in the last uh, few years that we're working with uh, Maxim, incre incredible. And there again, there is no other offer on the market on that particular type of products. You know, and I love the fact that it wasn't just a one shot collaboration, but it's an enduring collaboration where you have consistently come with new models of it, including one, but even including one for this year as well. You yeah, know, this and it's, year we, it's, we, we went further with a, giving a 3D approach on the case in particular and working on facets which is uh, really incredible. So Ricardo, uh, talking um, about partnerships, I wanted to talk to you about a collaboration that you had with a collector's community uh, here in Singapore, um, where I'm locked down, called Singapore Watch Club. Um, I think it was founded by my buddy Tom Chung. And uh, you guys created a really extraordinary watch, a classic fusion watch that incorporated traditional Chinese calligraphy into the dial and also an incredible dial that had the texture of beautiful old canvas. You know, I mean, and it's interesting to see that Hublot can have this kind of tradition in fine arts or in traditional, you know, calligraphy and also have such a beautiful artistic interpretation, even in a very modern watch. Yes, absolutely. So at Hublot, we try always also to, to do uh, this kind of, let's say, more local uh, partnerships. And uh, of course, with our uh, partner, the Hourglass and uh, Michael Tay, of course, that you know, my friend, your friend, uh, he, he's also very creative, I must say, with his team. And I would say that the idea in this case came from them. So we're showing that we are also open. I always say, when there is a good idea, I am always open, you know? So I would say in this case, the 100%, almost 100% of the idea came from, uh, from the, the market, from uh, the Hourglass team. And uh, I thought it was absolutely a great idea. And for us, again, to, to go on more, uh, uh, trying to interpret more traditional uh, art, like uh, this uh, Chinese calligraphy on this uh, canvas, uh, is something 
that if we do it, uh, we interpret it in a different way. Again, we can uh, we can succeed. If we would have done just, uh, I would say, you know, an MI cloisonné is not for Hublot. But in this case, uh, really, uh, the, the material is on the watch with the dial, is a real canvas, and uh, this uh, famous paintings, uh, Chinese calligraphy, and I think the result with a ceramic uh, case with a gold screws, a touch of rose gold, uh, the result is great, yes. No, it's, a, it's a really cool watch. And I guess on the subject of partnerships, um, I should also thank you for the past collaboration that we've had as well. You were very kind to create a watch for my magazine based in London, uh, The Rake. Um, and I think when we approached that watch, we wanted a classic fusion um, chronograph, but we wanted a watch that combined both uh, the ancient world and the modern world in the, in the same way that classic style, you know, suiting and so on, is, is a combination of the old world and the new world. And so we decided we'd like to make a watch that had one of the oldest materials in the world, which is bronze, and one of the most modern materials in the world that is titanium. And so um, thank you so much for creating this for us. Yes, absolutely. This uh, was again an idea that came from you uh, and to, to do this fusion between bronze and titanium with a, a strap which has also a fusion because it's rubber with, a, let's say, a, a, a leather with a vintage touch. Uh, the result of this watch yeah, is great. Again, for us, we don't want to do just vin uh, I mean, vintage look watches. We must always bring uh, a modernity in our watches because uh, when we go in that, uh, let's say, particular world of uh, vintage inspiration, I think uh, there are other brands that are doing that very well. But I think that Hublot should not do exactly. We always have to bring some modernity to everything that, uh, that we do. In this case, I think we find the right balance between a vintage touch, but uh, also modernity. Well, thank you, Ricardo. And Ricardo, I also want to thank you personally. I know I, I had I mentioned to you that we were going to be doing this charity auction to benefit the, the World Health Organization's um, COVID Solidarity Fund, which is a fund that directs funds to wherever in the world it's most badly impacted. So as you can see now, um, one of the countries that we love very much is Brazil. You know, we had a wonderful time there during the World Cup together. And you see now it's, it's number three in the world in terms of the number of cases. And, and you know, so to see uh, that this is really an international issue and it's something that we need to band together with solidarity to, to combat, um, that, that's amazing. Uh, thank you so much for donating the, the prototype of this watch to this auction, which will we'll launch on June 15th. And we'll follow up with some storytelling along the way. Uh, it's also a good opportunity for me because um, one day I came back to the office and um, my team had sold my watch, you know? It had been put in the safe because I was like, okay, then don't touch it. Uh, it was like the number one watch. I know I don't like, uh, I like the number one watches. I came back and I said, where's my watch? And they said, oh, no, no, uh, we had to sell it because the guy was so insistent. So now it's the opportunity for me to, to purchase this watch. So I'm gonna go for this one, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> amazing. Um, and then uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, the watches that you launched uh, earlier this year, well, one watch in particular, which is a, a particularly significant timepiece, which is the Integral. So this is your first uh, Hublot Big Bang with an integrated bracelet. Uh, tell me a little bit about why it was important for you. And I know you made it in three different versions, a beautiful titanium version, a beautiful gold version, and this limited edition uh, in ceramic, which is badass. Yeah, I would say, you know, Hublot, of course, with the years, we, we also uh, are reaching a certain maturity uh, of brands uh, in, in the market. And um, of course, as if we see what's going on on the watch, uh, luxury watch market, the metallic bracelet, uh, the bracelet is, is important to have it in your collection. And uh, of course, um, for, for some countries also, they, they love to have a, a bracelet, but to do just a watch on a bracelet is the most, uh, to, be, to be unique and different is the most difficult part of it. And you know, I am in this industry since many years and to realize um, uh, a bracelet with uh, some identity uh, is very difficult. So we started really from the bracelet and we tried to, to come with something where we worked uh, on the design perspective with some facets, uh, having a polished and brushed uh, effect. Uh, to give it a lot of value on the watch and to integrate, of course, a big bang with our Unico movement, with an open dial. And uh, so we believe that uh, the result is, inter is quite interesting. And uh, of course, uh, using uh, our art of fusion, and for me, the most important watch is the ceramic version, because I think when you go on a ceramic, there, is, there you 
you narrow the, the possibility to have these kind of watches on the market. And of course, we're starting just now. So in the future, uh, other uh, evolutions, especially in the ceramics, we can imagine, you know, we're specialized in colored ceramic uh, to, to come uh, either with the blue, with the white, and of course, the, the red, the, the vivid red, so it could be something also interesting uh, for the future. So we believe we can attract a part of uh, consumers that maybe would not come on the rubber, on the rubber strap uh, at uh, Hublot, but maybe through that watch, they could uh, be interested to, to come and to join our brand. And for some others uh, to have, a, let's say, an option, instead of having a big bang on rubber and maybe this big bang integral as a, as a second option is something possible. But of course, I think our core business will remain on rubber strap. But this one, uh, if we have success, if one day it represents, I would say, I don't know, 10% uh, yeah, of our sales, it would be already an immense success. It's a super cool watch. You know, I had the pleasure of trying this on. And, and the thing that I realize also, and, and the thing that's the reality about watch bracelets is also is, I would say 50% of watch bracelets are actually not that comfortable, right? <laughs> like 50% of them are good. And then there's a 10, 10, 10 of them are amazing. And, I, and this bracelet was remarkably comfortable. And I know you had mentioned that you had gone through a lot of different process, testing processes yeah. to make sure that it, it you know, didn't catch the hair, it conformed nicely to the wrist. And in, in conjunction with the 42mm uh, Big Bang also, it actually sits really well on the wrist. And I was, I was surprised that it actually fit a great variety of wrists as well, you know, which I know is important to you. Yes, absolutely. Uh, well, we've been working on the ergonomy. It's, it's really a project that we've been working almost uh, over four years. We took our time because it was not a strategic priority, but uh, I would say that it came at a moment what we believed it, was, it is the right moment now to, to launch it. But uh, we've been working really in the details uh, uh, of, of the, as you know, detail is really mo the most important part in uh, the creation of watches. And I think, yeah, the result is, uh, is really good. Last question for you. Um, you you'd mentioned the different materials that you're, you're known for, in particular your signature red uh, ceramic, but you're also very much known for sapphire and also colored sapphire. Would there be a possibility to have a full sapphire bracelet uh, integral? Yes, of course, of course. Uh, I am working on that, uh, but it's a, it's a long project because um, the industrialization of, uh, of sapphire takes, takes really a long time and uh, Every component uh, is, a, is a long time to industrialize. So as you can imagine, uh, on, the, on the bracelet, uh, you have uh, several uh, different links. And uh, when you decide to go and to realize this, this watch, I would say to be very efficient, it will take uh, at least uh, two years for the industrialization because you need the toolings, you need the raw materials, you need, of course, to, to test also the quality and uh, to be sure that, uh, because in our case, if we come with a, a full sapphire uh, integral, we won't produce 10 pieces. We will produce uh, 500 pieces, you know, so at least. So uh, of course is another approach than when you go for 10 pieces, you can have different, uh, uh, it's not the same. You know, for us, you must really do an, a real professional industrialization to be able to produce 500 pieces. And 500 pieces of the quality that's expected as well and that I know you represent very well. Yeah. Um, so, Ricardo, you know, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you uh, for joining us in particular on the 40th anniversary of Hublot, on the 15th anniversary of, of, of the Big Bang. Uh, thank you so much for your contribution to our charity auction for the World Health Organization. Wishing you all the best, sir. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Wade. Okay, my thank friend. You. Have a good day. Thank Bye. you. Bye.